Brandy for his PhD at the University of British Columbia with Matt Chapman, and then he moved for three years to Caltech, where he solved the um, binary black hole uh, problem uh, by himself, uh, making a breakthrough in radical relativity. And then he moved to PI at the University of Alberta for one year, and finally he's at Princeton University. Today he's going to talk about black hole and mental emergency. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to come uh, visit CETA again. <laughs> I was here for about six months back in 2006. Well, in 2006, I guess. <laughs> so it's nice to be back and see the familiar place. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, mergers of black hole neutron stars, which are the same people. Um, so this is an outline of, of the talk. And I'm going to give a brief overview of gravitational wave, uh, astronomy, and compact object groups. I guess it's not going to be uh, the old news to all of you. Um, then I want to spend a little bit of my time motivating these eccentric mergers that I'm going to spend a lot of time in the end showing some early results from simulations of these systems. So, to sort of set the stage, I'm going to overview expected populations and event rates for, um, for the, the, the traditional binaries that most people consider the uh, so-called primordial binaries, the binaries that are formed from uh, progenitor binary star systems, and to contrast them with dynamical capture binaries, so a binary system that's formed through a two-body interaction and a dense clustering binary. So in this, in this particular case, with compact objects, it's the emission of gravitational waves that cause them to be come down if they, if they interact sufficiently close. Um, and they argue that even though these might be quite a bit rarer than these primordial binaries, they might actually, they might actually be an observable population with advanced fiber. So the one thing that's different between dynamical capture binaries or the majority, or at least a large fraction of them, is that they can emerge with the highest efficiency, as opposed to the primordial binaries where uh, gravitational radiation uh, would have circularized the orbits quite a way uh, millions of years before they reach the advanced fiber band. And so that's why they become interesting systems, because now with this electricity, both the gravitational wave dynamics and for black hole neutron star systems, um, the, the interaction with the matter, the tidal structure, etc., can be very, very different. Um, and so in particular, if you know, folks in on black hole neutron stars, the, the interesting thing is not just the eccentricity, but the fact that um, there is matter involved with neutron stars. So, We'll talk about neutron stars and then show some of the early results of simulations. Okay, again, as everyone here is very familiar with, we're sort of on the verge of actually observing the universe in gravitational waves. And I don't think it's too bold a statement to say within the, the first the next five years there's going to be a first detection uh, of gravitational waves. And probably you know, one of these three um, methods could conceivably be the first ground based interferometers, pulsar timing, or beam methods. I guess the space-based uh, effort is quite in the distant future in particular since they most people that ELISA has not been chosen by uh, the European Space Agency. So that's another uh, speed in the, uh, in the effort to get a space-based detector. But at least these efforts are well underway. And um, probably within 10 years, definitely of the ground-based and also time detection with the polarization of the cosmic microwave background um, we'll see anything depends very much on how kind the universe is and having given us a source of primordial uh, gravitational waves. So for, for this, this talk, we're going to focus on contact objects, in particular those that are relevant to the ground-based interferometers. So just the one, one slide um, intro or overview of you know, what we might learn by observing contact object mergers. Um, well, first, it's going to be a direct probe of dynamical strong field gravity. And of course, there's general relativity has been tested very well in weak field regimes in the solar system. Uh, there's very good evidence for at least the relative uh, degrees of freedom of the theory in terms of the binary pulsar. Um, but there's no observational experimental constraints of the dynamical strong field. There's incontrovertible evidence that there are dark compact objects in our universe, but when they the black hole of general relativity, there really is no, no observational constraints. It's definitely consistent with it being black holes, but uh, we don't know for sure. And if you really want to actually understand this regime of general relativity and actually see black holes, 
and we need to observe thin gravitational waves, in particular when they collide with the complex of the community. Uh, the structure of the waves will be very indicative of the underlying theory. Now, if we add neutron stars to the mix, um, then that offers the opportunity to probe matter in extreme conditions. Um, and in particular, at present, there's really uh, very weak constraints from theory. There's no, there's no lab which can actually probe matter at nuclear densities. And there's, there's weak constraints from theory because it's such a difficult problem to calculate. So we don't really know what the equation of state is, for instance, or matter at nuclear densities. <coughs> and so if there's a compact object merger where there is this, where there is a neutron star, there's opportunity both by observing the gravitational wave emission and if there's you know, some counterpart, electron organic counterpart, then there's an opportunity to learn about uh, matter in extreme conditions. So just to give you some idea, and again, most of you have seen parts like this before, of you know, how far LIGO might be able to see, or how far initial LIGO would have been able to see, given what the plans are for advanced LIGO. Here's a plot from uh, Sathya Percussion Schutzen's recent review. Um, so here's the, sort of the initial LIGO noise curve, and essentially to just you know, focus on the, the compact object line here. That's essentially saying that if there had been a binary black hole merger within about 100 megaparsecs um, from us, or a binary neutron star within about 20 megaparsecs, that would have been easily visible uh, with initial LIGO sensitivity. Of course, because... Yeah, I'm so I'm guessing seven, seven solar masses. So that, that's sort of based on, they didn't actually say the review article, but uh, <laughs> I, I assume they get the canonical 1.4 solar mass and sort of extrapolate to, okay, that must probably be seven solar mass. But it's sort of that order, instead of mass, uh, black hole. Um, of course, because they didn't see anything, they told us that you know, within this particular volume, these events were relatively rare. Um, or playing devil's advocate, perhaps Einstein's equations are wrong, but even more, uh, um, the realistic conclusion is that these events are sufficiently rare. So of course, if we want to actually see them with some uh, sizable rate, we have to you know, see further. And so at least if we're an expectation for the advanced LIGO noise curve, well, if, if they do occur that closely, they're going to be extremely loud events. But uh, advanced LIGO can see binary black hole merge to cosmological distances, and neutron star merge to quite, quite uh, a large distance. So of course, the yeah, this is just what well, each one of these events occur, you know, how, you know, what would be the signal to noise um, at that particular distance. So the main question then becomes is the, the, the populations. Like how, how common do we expect these events to be? And here's another table from a, a review by the LIGO collaboration. Um, and I guess here they sort of relabeled things. And they usually speak of pessimistic to optimistic estimates, and now they just say low realistic and high. But in any case, this gives you some idea of what, what people expect using various um, models of sources, population synthesis currents, etc. For well, well, binary neutron stars, also fitting in the observations that we have, that there are, there are no binary neutron star systems. Um, and so you can see for the initial uh, LIGO, um, at least for the, these latest estimates of populations, we would have to be very lucky to actually see something with the first two years of LIGO. The more realistic ones are you know, quite low because the pessimistic ones are very low. But with the advanced interferometer um, noise curve, it's only the, pessim the most pessimistic estimates for uh, source populations uh, where we might only see one or two over a few lifespan. But realistically, advanced LIGO could see dozens, perhaps even hundreds of compact objects uh, in spirals. And he's saying this, this only, um, so this is for these primordial um, compact binaries. And there are certainly a class of uh, binaries that perform against clustering binaries through uh, two and three body interactions that in their late stages will look very much like primordial binaries. But these haven't been included in these estimates, uh, in part because of what these big things the models are very uncertain. Sorry, as I. As I mentioned before, for, for primordial binaries, the, well, why I'm calling the primordial binary is one that uh, originated as a field binary. So two massive stars in a binary star system, uh, they both, in the end states of their life, collapse down to compact objects, black hole neutron stars, and then eventually they move to gravitational, merge to gravitational wave. Now there's another class of binaries um, that could form 
dynamical capture biome, so if you have a dense cluster environment, you know, the chance encounter could be sufficiently close that either by tidal interactions or gravitational wave emission they can form a balanced system. And again, with compact objects, it's really gravitational wave emission which will dominate the form of binary. And of course, if this is a conceivable you know, source regardless um, of recent estimates, but I think people sort of discounted these as possible sources just because it seems so unlikely that these things, even in a dense environment like the Bobby that uh, that a compact object would get so close that it could actually uh, become bound. But a couple of recent estimates suggest that perhaps the numbers aren't as pessimistic as what might have been thought naively. Um, so O'Leary collaborators for um, <coughs> nuclear cluster estimated one to ten thousand events per year, a thousand events per year for advanced fiber. And then people since then have called some of their assumptions optimistic. So this you know, this might be a order of magnitude uh, optimistic. Uh, but still not not in ten to the minus five or something where it's something that you want to completely ignore. Um, and more recently, the collaborators um, looked at three situations in globular clusters and found event rates for these compact objects in the vicinity of, so not, not live observ of, of, of observation rates, but event rates in, in the universe of something like one to perhaps 100 per year per cubic meter parser. And incidentally, they were, they were just said interested directly in the gravitational wave <coughs> Uh, aspect of the problem, um, but they were arguing that these event rates are sufficiently high that direct collisions of neutron stars and globular clusters could account for at least some, some fraction of uh, short gamma ray bursts. Okay, so, that, so this is, you know, maybe there's another source of compact object merge, that's good, you know, the estimates might go up for what we should see with the advanced LIGO. But the interesting thing about thinking of these as two different classes of sources is that generically they're going to, the, the dynamics are going to be very different. In particular, these dynamical uh, capture binaries are going to generically merge with large eccentricity. In other words, for them to get so close that on that initial encounter they can emit enough gravitational waves to become bound, uh, the very center distance of the orbit is going to be so close that there's not going to be enough time to circularize by the usual uh, Peters and Matthews mechanism. And so quite a sizable fraction of these will, will be born with large eccentricity. So what, what are the primary differences, or what is interesting about high eccentricity? Well, first, just from the, the, the perspective of gravitational wave detection, the template or the signal is going to be very different. Uh, it's going to be more a series of bursts than a chirp. Um, and you know, the, the, those noise curves for the, you know, the, the curve for the, uh, the, the signal strength of these in spirals, that assumes some kind of optimal uh, search for some kind of optical data analysis. So you know, if, if, if you don't have templates that are sort of, um, that are adapted to observing these sequence of bursts and you just use usual you know, in-spiral chirp signals or perhaps just single burst signals, um, the, the effective distance out to which you can see these sources are going to be drastically reduced. So if you really want to, if we think that these might be um, there might be a decent population of these definitely not templates that can actually uh, match these events. So to give you some idea of it, and of course these are, there's not nearly been as much study of these systems as there has been in the primordial boundaries, but just to give you some idea um, of how many there might be, so I was taking the results from Persis and, and Levin, um, who estimated that this repeated burst phase of an eccentric in spiral could be seen out to distances of perhaps two to three hundred megaparsecs uh, for, for black hole neutron star systems. And if we fold that in with a lead, uh, they pay estimates, that suggests we might have a detection rate of something like 0.3 to 10 per year for advanced LIGO. So certainly not as, as much as what might be expected in the optimistic range for primordial binaries. But this is still a number that I think is something where this could be an interesting uh, set of events to, to go after. So here, incidentally, with this, this estimate, they, they, they use post newtonian techniques for these eccentric uh, in spirals. And just they didn't trust, they didn't trust their, the, the expansion closer than 10 and they attempted to cut off the signal at 10 a. Because that's not going to make a difference for the lower mass systems, because the, high, the, the merger part is going to be outside of the advanced LIGO band. But for the more massive systems, you could potentially see them out to larger distances. So, 
there are several things that are interesting about merging with electricity, which I'll sort of go over now. One of them, in terms of the orbital dynamics, is that there is that you could see some kind of zoom world behavior in orbit. And so to, to remind you what, what zoom world orbits are, um, so at, at a first glance, you might think it's just uh, sort of an, ex an extreme limit of very standard position. Yeah. Can, can I just ask you about the uh, populations before we get too far? Um, mm -hmm. Is uh, having a tree body interaction where the eccentricity is driven by cosi a possible way to get high eccentricity? Yeah, so there have been uh, some so there have been studies of that, but I don't think there have been estimates. As far as I know, I tried to uh, about a year ago in the literature to see if there have been estimates of how frequent those kinds of three body systems might be, but I couldn't find any. Um, but I guess when we were at Caltech, Lynch and those people were doing this, they looked at Koza, oh, so we were also there. So, so they, they looked at, the, at these systems, but I don't think you did it in clear estimates. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, so did that, in some sense, if you will, this, this, so think of this as a lower estimate. I mean, if we add the merger part of the signal, that's going to go up. And perhaps if these systems are more frequent than what I expect, that's also, that's also going to go up. Okay. Um, so dual behavior is it's sort of an interesting, sort of uniquely general atomistic um, uh, aspect of sort of the two-body problem. Um, and so, for example, in Newtonian mechanics, you take a two-body problem and you add perturbation, you get precession. So you can sort of think of GR at even order as causing precession. But zoomal behavior is actually different from, from precession. So let me sort of give you an example of a geodesic in Swartzel. So this is a geodesic going in Swartzel with some eccentricity. And you can see there's a lot of precession there. Um, that is the event horizon at 2M. This is the innermost stable circular orbit at 6M. And so you can see the closer we get to the innermost stable circular orbit, the more precession we get. And then the zoom all orbit's a bit different. And here's an example of, of the zoom all orbit. And you'll see, well, one difference is that it actually, the, the point of closest approach is within the ISCO. So here it goes. But instead of just processing a bit, it rolls around for a large amount of time. It zooms out to some distance. It comes in and rolls around several times. And that repeats. And so, and so the, 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 the difference is, um, in the sense that once you cross the most stable circular orbit, there aren't stable orbits anymore. Um, and so zoomal orbits are actually, it's, it's, sort of a, it's, a, it's an interesting contradiction. In the, well, I'll get to it in the next slide. But in some sense, they are, um, what, what distinguishes them, well, they, they're unstable orbits, essentially. And so what you, so one aspect of them is you get extreme sensitivity to the initial conditions. So for example, um, here I'm just going to show 150 you know, post regular orbits and non zoom moving orbits. And here I've changed the initial tangential velocity by one part in, in 10. And so you can see, OK, there, there they go. It's a, it's a uniform range in the initial velocity. So of course, as the dynamics proceeds, there's going to be some spreading of trajectory to the time. Um, but the difference with zoom all orbits uh, is that it becomes exponentially sensitive to the initial conditions. In other words, you can take a, a given orbit, a given sort of uh, epicenter, and a given pericenter, and by just finally adjusting the velocity, so essentially that it's sort of indistinguishable all that you can choose, that there are as many walls as you like to zoom every sort. Here, for example, I'm doing the same thing with 100 or 300 zoom orbits tuning in the sixth decimal place. And I've chosen 300 as opposed to 150 because half of them are going to fall into the black hole after the first encounter. And so you're going to see how sensitive the resulting orbit is to the initial conditions. So you know, quite, quite drastically different from the previous case. Um, and so the real one way of understanding these rumor orbits is that they are actually perturbations of unstable circular orbits that exist in the history. Um, in particular, so it's a, it's a bit of a paradoxical situation. So you've got circular orbits outside the innermost stable circular orbit. You perturb them and they're almost circular. But now once you cross, you cross the innermost stable circular orbits, 
these circular orbits are actually eccentric in the sense that they look circular until you perturb them and then you see that they actually are eccentric. So you, in, in terms of you know, the, the, the integration constants that you'd associate with them, you, you give them some eccentricity. And so for example, if you start with orbits in the range 4m to 6m and you perturb them, you get elliptic tumor orbits. From 3m to 4m, you get hyperbolic orbits. In the sense of the one whole episode, and then they'll either escape um, or they'll pull into the black hole. And essentially, the number of holes that you'll see in the orbit depends on how far you're away from um, the, the exactly unstable circular orbit. This is the following expression. This is the, it's the diagonal experiment of the, the orbit. But, so incidentally, there's also sort of you know, the fact that there's a that the limiting case for photons is at 3m. This also tells you that you know, from a geodesic's point of view, the effective, or the effective event horizon for the space time is at 3m, it's not at 2m. You can never probe a black hole space time closer than 3m in geodesics. Okay, so that's one interesting thing that's, that's um, associated with the centric mergers, um, uh, at least in terms of the orbital dynamics. Um, now, just a, a, a little bit more of a detail of why mergers involving neutron stars are, are interesting, as I mentioned, it's a bit of a but, but the, the main thing is we really don't know much about the interior structure of neutron stars in the and yet today. In particular, the nature of matter at these extreme densities. And as I said, we can't recreate that matter in maps on Earth, and it's really difficult to model for anything. So observations of black hole neutron star mergers um, is, a, is, a, is a great potential tool to be able to observe aspects of, of neutron stars from which we might be able to infer properties about the information of say. Um, and essentially the, the way that that is going to, uh, in the nature of matter at these, so the microscopic nature of matter at these densities is going to affect macroscopic properties of the system is depending on the equation of state, that changes the mass radius relationship for a given neutron star. And how big the neutron star is, is you know, as you see, it's going to be very important um, to determine how it's, the dynamics of the, the, the um, at least whether it's highly disruptive or not. So essentially, I mean, the, the range of the conceivable equations of state you know, can result in essentially radii that they provide perhaps a factor of two. So it's not it's not just a small effect changing the equation of state can actually have a large effect on the uh, properties of the neutron star. And if the neutron star is disrupted or if you merge you have two uh, neutron stars that merge, um, the dynamics of the matter after this collision is going to be very sensitive to the equation of state. Um, so, so for example here's a, a study by Shimada's group um, where they looked at the merger of two neutron stars with different equations of state. Uh, and this is the, the resulting gravitational wave from these two. Like we get exactly what the equations of state are. But so two bracketing equations of state. And you can see from the gravitational wave the spectrum of these two mergers, they apples and oranges different. They're not just slightly different. And one, uh, I'm not 100% I'm not sure that I get the technical detail, but one reason why could have such a very good emergent signal is if you form a hypermassive neutron star. So the neutron stars merge initially and over the mass limit for a, a, for a stationary neutron star, but um, sort of angular momentum and EV supporting them against collapse. Um, but exactly when they collapse is very sensitive to the equation of state. So if one of these, probably this way, one which sort of essentially has a comp collapse. This one stayed in a hypermassive state for a while longer before uh, it would collapse. But for an idea, we'll post at this diagram. You know, it's, 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 unfortunately, that's the advanced LIGO uh, uh, noise curve. So all this interesting stuff for providing neutron stars at least is happening at frequencies too high for advanced LIGO to see. And so that's why they're, they're sort of arguing for this Einstein telescope, the next generation which will be sensitive to higher frequencies and they will very clearly be able to distinguish relational state effects. Okay, so, so, so now let's go to black hole neutron star systems and there are a couple of reasons why they are perhaps more interesting for initial LIGO. One is if you just do uh, sort of back of the envelope calculation, <coughs> the black hole neutron star systems are from typical neutron star masses and typical black hole masses that we expect we'll find that the, 
the distance at which the neutron stars will start to be highly disrupted by the black hole um, for this range of system occurs as in the scenario in the most stable circular orbit. So, well, the fir first of all, the, the fact that the, the neutron that the neutron star is going to be highly disrupted by the black hole while it's still outside is great for trying to understand about the equation of state. So as in how the black hole tears apart the neutron star is going to depend on the equation of state. And then perhaps like in the previous example, there might not be um, an observable gravitational wave uh, signal because it's at too high frequencies, but there's definitely going to be a lot of electromagnetic and neutrino emission um, in this process. And exactly how that happens is going to depend on the equation of state. So, so as opposed to, for instance, a neutron star falling into a supermassive black hole, it's going to be like a point particle. It's not going to matter. So it's sort of lucky that the neutron star does get torn apart by the black hole. The fact that it occurs near the, the, the unstable circuit orbits is really interesting from a geo point of view as well, because now it's happening in the regime where the, this is the strongest um, deviations from Newtonian dynamics that we can, can explore. So it's being ripped apart. In the, in the most general relativistic part of the space time. So not only could we potentially see about matter in extreme conditions, we could see about gravity in extreme conditions in the system as well. And of course, this, this estimate it doesn't make a difference if it's a primordial or a dynamic capture uh, binary. But the, the difference with the primordial binary is when, when the system reaches the innermost stable circular orbit, or when it reaches the point where it starts to be tightly disrupted, I mean, it's essentially the dynamics is over. There's going to be very little um, of, the, of the orbit that's going to remain. And so um, the amount of material that could be left over is, in general, very, well, it's not going to be very much necessarily. And there's not going to be such a strong imprint of this disruption on, on the gravitational wave signal. On the other hand, it's dynamical capture by is with the high eccentricity because the, the effect of innermost stable orbit with eccentricity is closer to the black hole. There can be multiple close encounters of the black hole with a neutron star. Each one of these close encounters, there could be some uh, entitled disruption, material that could be onto the black hole, some material rejected. Um, and so there's a possibility of having um, the strong field gravity and the, the matter effects imprinted on the observables in a much a more pronounced way. And of course, what's interesting with, with, you know, with black hole neutron star modes as opposed to these binary neutron stars is that the, the frequencies get shifted towards the left. They're more massive systems. So they're going to start creeping into the regime where uh, advanced light can start seeing some of the effects. So let me now show you some results of some early simulations of these uh, eccentric uh, mergers. So this is with Francis Stevens and the graduate students. Uh, um, so we just in it's a huge parameter space to explore. For a first study, we just picked a set of parameters that we thought might be most interesting. So we're going to start with the, the yeah, four to one mass ratio black hole to neutron star system. So we figure it was a 1.35 solar mass neutron star with various degrees of state. So about a five, five and a half solar mass black hole. It's perhaps on the low end of what is expected. Um, for black holes, but not necessarily um, not, not, not unrealistically low. In this study, we can solve the velocity at infinity of a thousand kilometers per second, which is relevant for uh, nuclear clusters. This is, of course, much higher than what's going to be uh, found in globular clusters. In terms of the, the close dynamics, though, this amount of extra kinetic energy is completely irrelevant. The thing that this will change, though, is what the critical impact parameter the capture is. So in this case, with 1,000 kilometers per second, if they pass between 3,000 m of, of one another, then through gravitational wave emission alone, they'll be captured. It turns out that due to gravitational focusing, um, the cross-section for capture is linear in the pericentric separation, or the initial pericentric separation. So we, we label our, uh, our, instead of using impact parameter, we just use pericentric <coughs> separation and 3,000 m for impact parameter corresponds to a very simple separation of 42 m. Uh, we're going to be looking at three different spins, uh, non-spin black hole initially, and two spins, plus or minus 0.5, uh, aligned with all the land and momentum. Of course, in these, in these dynamical capture systems, there's really no reason to expect that they're going to be aligned. But again, just because 
we have limited computer resources, we just get to solve it for a simple set and eventually we'll explore a, a monoline system. Uh, this is, at this moment we've just got gravity and I, I deal hyperdynamics. Of course, eventually we'd like to look uh, at more interesting narrow components. Um, for the equation of state, we've sort of tried three piecewise for the coffee equations of state from this, this work by Lee et al. where they labeled them using pencil, a pencil labels, number, uh, <laughs> labeling system. So, so, so we chose one which was sort of a soft equation of state which immediately stuck just to crack it, uh, the, the, the possibilities. So before I show you some of the, the animations and the, and the tables and the figures, just uh, the punchline, the take of line, is that there's a tremendous amount of variability in the in the, the signal, both the gravitational waves and the matter dynamics as a function of these parameters. In particular, we can there's you know, certain ranges of parameters where there's a lot of material that in the accretion lives, and, and that's thought to be important if these are for generators or for gamma ray bursts. In cases where there is a lot of tidal disruption, we also find that there's actually a lot of material that's unbound. Sometimes as much as about 50% of the material um, that is disrupted is actually unbound. And we, because we don't follow the material for very long after the simulation, but once it's disrupted, based on the local fluid velocities, we sort of estimate is all this escape, and so that's how we estimate that they're unbound. Um, and we don't, I'll, in the table, you can sort of see for yourself how much we fine tune these conditions, but it's not very much, not nearly as much as the, I showed you the GNS, so of course we don't get that much zoom more behavior. But there are some examples where you do see this effect of zoom more in the waveform. And so okay, there's a lot of variability, but it really, again, it, all of it just boils down to you know, two basic uh, properties. One is a radius of the neutron star, and so that's a function of the equation of state, especially if you fix the mass, and so given the equation of state, that sets the radius of the neutron star. And then what the, the, the distance of this initial point of closest approach, this very same separation is to the innermost stable circular orbit for that particular orbit black hole system. And so again, it's the, it's the eccentricity of the black hole spin and the impact parameter that can affect it. It's really just how puffy the neutron star is and where this, this radius of last interaction with the black hole is that it's going to form its variability. So but there's, there's a lot of degeneracy where you can get things that look very much the same by just choosing different parameters. So it really boils down to these are the sort of main reasons why we get all this variability. So let me just first show you this sort of <laughs> these trajectories and sorry, it's a ridiculously messy part. But I just wanted to point out one, one example of, of this variability. So look at these two curves, the, the red and this dash, and this magenta curve over there. So these are exactly the same orbital parameters, but just two different equations of state. So the stiffest with the softest. And here, just after one encounter, you can see the trajectories are macroscopically different. So they start essentially indistinguishable after just one encounter, they're very different. So of course, the resultant matter dynamics and the gravitational waveform is going to be very different. Just, just to give you how strong the effect of the equation of state can be in the spinal stage of the orbit. And I'll show you an animation of this one. Um, or, well, one of them, I think it's that one now, the, the, the stiff one. And one reason why it's so much different is that there's a lot more tidal disruption uh, at the initial encounter. Here's an animation of one example. Um, I'm showing you the rest mass density. This is a logarithmic cover scale. Um, this is an orbital plane. There's a black hole. I think the neutron stars are coming from this side. Um, as all of these, um, these high resolution shock capture methods, we have an atmosphere. And so you'll see some atmosphere effect at a very low density range. Um, but this is going to be uh, a system, a non-spinning black hole. This is the, the point of closest approach. And in this case, there's going to be one close encounter, a little bit of tidal interaction, um, and then it's going to merge. So there's the neutron star. The growth of the black hole is a gauge effect there. It doesn't grow really. You see, there's the initial interaction. There's a little bit of material get, that gets ripped off. Um, the, the initial interaction with the black hole and neutron star perturbs the neutron star quite strongly. It looks like it's sent into this little spinning uh, football type shape. Um, and it turns out that, here's the gravitational waves from that. 
that result. So you can see here's the first verse from that first emission pattern. Here's a final merger first. And so in, in between, you see a little signal coming from what appears to be the, the, the time you disturb a spinning neutron star. But in this case, it's not really, it hasn't been talked up. What has been, what's happened, or what seems to have happened, is that an F node has been excited in the neutron star. So here I'm going to show uh, a movie of the neutron star after that first interaction, but transformed to its rest frame. Um, and so this is the, the energy density of the star overlaid on these, uh, the velocity field of the neutron star. And you can see that, that this pattern is not. If it were a rigid rotation, you'd see sort of a vortex structure in the velocity flows, but it isn't. It's like this, this pattern that's sort of indicative of air flow. And so really, you're just seeing sort of a, a pattern shape of this air flow that looks like a short So this close encounter is exciting air flow in the neutron star. And that's what you see looking like a, a spin. Um, and that's also causing little wiggles in the, in the gravitational waves. Okay, so this, the second example, so this is now um, the case with, oh yeah, so this, this is that, that one, the one trajectory I showed you. So again, a non-spinning black hole, but now a very stiff equation of state. So here the, the, the neutron star is much larger, it's much puffier. And I'm zooming out a little bit, I don't know why it's coming in from this angle in this case, but there's a black hole, there's a neutron star. The scale is a little bit different. And in this case, because it's puffier, so even the previous one, the interaction, when closest approach is 6.95. Here it's a little bit further out, but because it's puffier, it's actually a much larger tidal interaction or interaction with the matter. And in fact, it's a significant amount of matter is sort of stripped off on the first encounter. So you can see the neutron star is sort of stretched into this very long tidal shape, but then it moves away from the black hole, and it's actually got enough self-gravity that it coalesces again into this compact object. And then on the second encounter, it moves with the black hole. In this case, there's a huge amount of material left after in this, in this sort of semi-disc-like structure, and about half of that material is actually estimated to be down. And so you can tell me, we're not doing radiation or any, anything like that, but you can imagine, to show you again, that there, sh there could be some very interesting electromagnetic signals associated with it. So first year, as it's being disrupted, so a lot of material here is flung off into the tidal tail. This is also looks like a, a severely non-linear F mode. Then also notice here, so now the second tidal sort of tail is going to collide with the first one. So a lot of interesting dynamics. And one thing that's of special interest in the gamma inverse uh, model is that it's the amount of very weakly bound for a long dynamical time. A so lot of work time to it. Very long dynamical time, appreciative time. Right, so, this, so, this so in this case, you would have much more material, which is just bound. Yeah, so there's going to be the whole spectrum from unbound to bound. There's going to be some material that will come back at, a, at some arbitrary time uh, into the future. So we sort of estimated, at least based on the, the, the velocities, when they would come back, and it follows that t to the minus t to the square or something that we just came up with. 34 years ago. But yeah, so that, that is, sorry. yeah, that, that is, that is something which is also, again, we would just, just, like this is as far as we take the days and just estimate this and you can sort of think that there's going to be a lot of accretion um, over the next while. Okay. So here's, here's the gravitational wave from that example. So you can see again, there's a double burst. You also can see this what's now a much less uh, sinusoidal but a very uh, non-linear F mode signal. Of course, here yeah, the difference is this initial burst is large, but it a lot, the, the stock neutron star lost a lot of material and here it's being disrupted. So the, the merger is actually uh, kind of a whimper compared to the previous one. Let me just show you sort of a few tables of um, some of the, the results. I mean, I don't really focus on all of these numbers, but just to give you some idea um, of some of the variability and also I mentioned sort of how fine-tuned these, these, these you know, how rare these particular the more extreme events might be. So this is the case with the non-spinning black hole, the, the intermediate equation of state. This is the, uh, the initial point of closest approach. For some of these ones where the initial period is further out, we don't know 
we didn't follow the three version, the, the eccentric orbits that they're on are essentially too long. We didn't have the we didn't want to use a computer time to follow them. So we just followed them through the first encounter. This is the estimate of gravitational waves that are in, the, in this first encounter. Um, if they do merge, this is the total of gravitational waves that are, are merged. Um, this is an estimate of the amount of material that's outside after complete disruption and merger. So some, sometime after the center of the core of the neutron star falls in, this is how much material is left over. And this is how much we estimate is on that. I mean, I mentioned that the, the cross section uh, is essentially linear in this parameter. So you can see this is sort of where we get, at least in this first encounter phase, where we get this extreme variability. And so this is perhaps you know, 2.5 out of 40. So you know, perhaps you know, 5 to 10 percent of these events will show this extreme variability. And of course, with some of these others on their second and third encounter, there could also be a similar variability. So, and at some point when you go sufficiently far out, so perhaps you know, an encounter that's at 35 of, um, that will there's a history will be sufficiently large that will eventually circularize and you won't get this. But at least a lower bound might be you know, five to ten percent of these cases are going to show these very extreme matter disruptions and perhaps perhaps quite a bit more if you can eventually follow through with some of these other cases. Um, here's now an example of a spinning black hole, so plus five, minus five. And this thing I want to point out, so as as you increase the spin, um, the effect of ISCO shrinks. And so you can see that um, now, for in this case, for example, the non-spinning case, this uh, it's a, a close to approach, initial close to approach of five, this merged immediately. There was very little material that was flying out. But now that the ISCO is lower, um, some part of the neutron star is going to be outside the ISCO. Um, and so you see uh, there's a lot of material in that case, that is, on an increasing distance on that side down. Conversely, if we go to a, co to a counter rotating case, the ISCO moves out, and there's very, very little tidal disruption that happens essentially. The, the, all of the, um, to these are sort of more like point particle particle mergers. Um, for the different equations of state, sorry, I think I showed this one instead of the, the first one, but it's we can say the, the same point. So the different equations of state, again, so now the slipper one is puffier, and so you can see there's a lot more material that could be on down um, to form an equation this. And going to the slipper equations of state, there's almost no material that's disrupted and it behaves much more like a point particle. So you can kick in just to give you some idea of the, how sensitive these, these events are to the equations of state. Um, the black hole spin, so we need, in the case where we initially start with a non-spinning black hole, we get a spin of about you know, 0.5. The cases where there's more disruption, so this was perhaps the most extreme disruption and unbound event, there's less black hole spin, there's a lot more material than we can out. And of course, as we add spin to the black hole, the final black hole is going to have more spin and less spin, so not, not too surprising there. In terms of the gravitational waves, um, so Eventually, what we want to do is we want to count the templates for these things. It's going to be very difficult to run the multiple encounters, especially with the ones which have very uh, large eccentricity orbits, it's just too long a time scale. So, what we're going to hope to do initially is just look at the amount of gravitational waves that have been emitted on each close encounter, estimate the change in orbital parameters, and try and stitch these things together, and then eventually the final models. So, so this is just to show you sort of what, or what one of these waves looks like on a close encounter. And interestingly, at least in terms of the phase, it's, very, it's a very good match to the Newtonian quadrupolar constellation. Essentially, the Peters and Matthews turbulent type approach, where they say, well, let's just take a Newtonian orbit, let's you know, use the quadrupolar formula to tell us how much energy and angular momentum is lost, and then let's feed that back into the change of the orbit. And so at least here in the phase, it's very close by. But one thing that's different is that the, the Pluto rest of this case, the amplitude is a lot larger. So we have multiplied, in this case it was R to 10, by a little bit more than a factor of 2 with the amplitudes to, the, to match. So there's much more emission in the fully relativistic case, even though the phase matches quite well. And then when you when we get much closer to the, the unstable orbits, you can see that there's sort of almost an exponential increase in the amount of energy in this first burst. And that's because of the zoom ball dynamics that's starting to um, manifest. Uh, 
And incidentally, these, so these are sort of measurements from the simulations, and this is not a fit to the data in so much as it's, it's a model assuming that it's human behavior and we fit into this instability experiment. So it's a partial fit, but not a, um, so just for demonstrating that it does seem to be what's happening. And just finally, so this is the, the waves from the, the merger ring down parts of the waveforms for various examples. Just to show you again how much variability there is in the spinal stages. So this is sort of a very prompt merger without much disruption. Um, here you see cases where there's, there's, there's a lot more, there's a little bit of the zoom will be able that's starting to be evident. This is actually an eccentric case that we were, that we started to simulate. So we want to, it's going to be too difficult to simulate <coughs> with the whole parameter range, but then what we're going to do is we're going to simulate the, the, the close encounters of ranges of eccentricity and try to stitch them together. And here's one example of the, um, not initially unbound, but it's a balance system. And here's now an example with a uh, spin. And this was that, that example that I showed you before where there was that initial strong burst here in the merging part of the screen with you. Okay, so the, the, the conclusion, uh, I think we're on the doorstep which in the next few years of observing the universe with gravitational waves. Um, there are many interesting sources. I want to hopefully try to convince you that even though these black, eccentric black hole neutron star mergers may be rare, they are perhaps, in some sense, a golden binary system. Um, they can teach us about uh, strong field of gravity, they can teach us about uh, magnetic nuclear densities. Um, it's going to be probably the, you know, the, 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 the most interesting part of general relativity and, um, and magnetic nuclear densities. They might be rare, but they might be very exceptional events. And it's, I think it's sort of worth it to, to start to investigate what the consequences might be. And so in terms of the future work, we, we want to come up with some kind of template, at least model templates, not necessarily <coughs> good enough, but at least one where we can start asking the question. So let's take the event rate estimates from me and the nearest of those people, and let's take some model LIGO noise curve. What are the, how many of these events might we actually be able to see? Is it that to the back of the envelope 0.3 to 10 per year, is that actually correct? Um, if it is in that ballpark, I think it would be worth it to investigate more time to come up with real field rates. Um, and we can do some things like try to estimate the electromagnetic vision by just taking the snapshots of say the ignition disk, uh, estimate of the temperature, and trying to do some, some very simplistic things. Um, in the longer term, is we really want to model the, the, the non-gravitational aspect that we want to put in electromagnetic fields, machine and radiation, but that's uh, and I say everyone here knows who's trying to do the best and uh, not the uh, easy thing to do. Okay, thank you. So, where did the most common thing be you have a bound line with the largest electricity and it's gravity based to reduce the overall energy or increase the energy? Yeah. The uh, electricity is maintained by the electricity that starts. It, it does, it does start to increase. So, right, so well, it's, uh, if you start with that, it's usually 0.95. Yeah. Then it takes a long time. Yeah, so, so I guess it depends also what the, the very central distance is. So if it's, you know, if it's a large very central distance, exactly. it will eventually circularize. But for, for, for the, well... Well, it depends what you mean by large. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember vaguely looking at this whole issue just how the electricity scales with the major axis. We start with quite a large eccentricity, and I thought it would be quite slow. Yeah, really, yeah. So I think it's like the rate at which the pericenter distance decreases versus eccentricity. I think that's the pericenter distance is faster for these large eccentric systems. And so I think you, you have to go, you have to be, so I think for professional these these dense cluster environments where the, the critical impact or critical pericenter distance is 42. Those might not ever circularize efficiently. I think you go to a globular cluster environment, say 30 kilometers per second, I think that moves it out to about 500 for RP. And those ones, if you know, it's in the range of a few hundred, it will be a large eccentricity, and those actually might might circularize. But I'm not 100% I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. Oh, well, but here's the thing, though. I mean, then you start with such a system, and then it'll come in and that, and it's different than the orbital disruption, mm -hmm. in that, you know, you could imagine that this 
dramatically approaches the power disruption protocol. Yeah. Um, so you're you're yeah, you're exactly. choosing impact parameters to give an right. interesting interaction on the first pass. Right. But I think when it starts to get to RPs of you know, seven, eight, or nine. Um, then, then it stops being adiabatic. For some sense, then the next encounter is not going to just be epsilon close to it's going to be one end closer. And so I think once you start to get to the view where it's going to start to be value disruptive, it's not going to be adiabatic anymore. So you'll have the, the last few events I can imagine will be quite, each one will be quite different. So you'll just be on the verge of the entire disruption. The next one will be 10% or something like that. The next one might be a military. So the NASP field is very dramatic. And we'll stop it being the I'm guessing, to, based, on, based on this stuff, like we, we haven't yet followed any more than one encounter and then a military. So we haven't done a two encounter one yet. Um, so that just based on it's, it's essentially the, the first encounter, how dissipative it was compared to just the people's imaginaries type of instruments. So when you take the guess effectively all the tidal interaction and gravitational wave emission becomes very non-adiabatic all the time in the last few stages. So you talked about gravitational wave emission uh, So sorry, say again? So in, instead of doing a template search, the part I'm trying to find you the first search, they just have to find you the first so, so I think if, if, if it happens sufficiently nearby that each burst is individually invisible, then I think mean, that's fine. I, I think that the, the issue would be if, if there are, say, a dozen bursts, and each one is slightly just below threshold. I think then you'd want, you'd want sort of a coherent burst search net. At least, I'm not sure that's what the like people would say, but I don't think there is a coherent burst search effort at the moment. Because it, to be, if you want to like somehow stack the bursts together to get larger signal noise, you have to maintain the phase gradients. You can't just shift them in time. You have to also get the phases right. Well, I was, um, yeah, I was very well defined. A couple of bursts have to be like a Yeah. So, but, but I think, well, let's say the last two bursts are just above threshold and so you could infer based on you can measure the parameters and there might have been uh, a few before that but if they all say the signal to noise of three or four or five yeah. I think it might be difficult to to, to extract them but if you can somehow coherently add them um, you have to estimate that you give assume that you currently add on the velocity person. Yeah. So, so, so to, to, to see that the 300 uh, megaparsec would have to add all the bursts. Right, so what, what Cosis 11 did with their estimates that you could see into two to 300 megaparsecs, they, they they're basically a template. <laughs> and then I guess that would be, if you could optimally add them correctly, it's likely in the template. So, so, yeah, and it might be very challenging to actually get templates um, because of the time scales between, between the groups. But I think that, that's probably a the way to go, but I'm not an expert in the data analysis, so I'm not quite sure how you go about doing coherent first searches, but there's probably some, there's probably some, it might not yet have been introduced in relativity, but there might be, I'm sure there's some way of doing coherent first searches. So. I guess another point, well, it's more of a thought, since one of the motivations is to uh, increase a laboratory in which you test the GLT right, it would be nice to see some simulations done with the gravity of the model right, which I can see what the rest of Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> so that, yeah, so it would be a bit the decision at the end, but that, that's something which I, I'm also very interested in. And the problem is, I don't know of a theory which is sort of well motivated and mathematically well posed where we can start asking those questions. Actually, with, with neutron stars, it might be a bit better, because then you can do a scale of tensor type theory. And that's, uh, that's a relatively, um, it's at least a well-posed problem from a mathematical point of view, because it has to be mathematically well-posed before you can put it into computers. Some of these things like Chern-Simons gravity, or you know, that, that 
But I looked at them a bit, they, they did seem very, very promising in that, in that regard. The problem is that they typically have higher derivatives. They're not second derivative theories. And you can find exact solutions, but if you want to try to do it numerically, they're might be. They're just not well built. They don't make sense. Whereas scalar tensor theories are well built. The problem is they're very well constrained by just solar system tests and the binary also. So we could, we could do something like that and artificially crank up the parameters to values that are already excluded by existing tests. But it would be really nice if, if someone could come up with an alternative theory for general relativity, just as a small man. You know, it might not have to be well motivated from other methods that's fully consistent with existing observations, but has very different, different strong predictions. Like turn science does that, it's just a bit of that cruel first. So. You've been very ignorant about this, in general, what about this large cosmological constant? So, so that's, so the general expectation is things, like what people do with alternative theories to study cosmological problems, these change the infrared part of the theory, so the large scale dynamics, and it really doesn't affect the very late time, the short length scale, short time scale dynamics that have in these, in these mergers. Um, so you can, add, you can add a huge cosmological constant if you wanted, but by the time where gravitational radiation is more important than cosmological expansion, eventually that's a runaway process. It will take over, and the last stages will happen almost as if there wasn't a cosmological constant. So you, so you want something which, which changes the theory on short length scales or large curvature scales. So So, so going to higher spin would be, would be great. Um, so we just start with 0.5 because it's easy. Yeah. Um, <coughs> you can imagine that if you do excision, you have to be, you have to be very careful with how you do it. You store yeah, our excision main, take. Sorry. Excision is the main problem. Yeah. So, so we need, we need to. Um, so, so, so there's a one to resolution issue. So you need to. Your excision surface is that much closer to. Uh, the apparent horizon, and so you need that much more resolution to resolve it. And what we, what we also find with, in these cases, our excision sphere is we just take the best fit of lips. Uh, we don't try to match the, the, the shape. And when, for the, for the, the neutron stars that aren't strongly tied to disrupted, but there's still a strong core, that creates a very strong sort of little bump in the shape of the of the excision surface, and so for very high spins, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's not good enough, just the uh, best for the lips of the better, better way of doing it. So, and I think we could go 0 0.7, 0 0.8 without changing our, that just technological as as we have to go, but one with 0 0.8, 0 0.9, we need to do it on that. I mean, we definitely want to do at least for now, we just have to do it right. Any other questions? No, it's time to get ahead.